Our Becoming Better series invites us to develop faith practices that strengthen our relationships with God and others in our community. We've created a habit tracker to help each of us nurture our faith through worship, service, study, giving, and sharing. We have even created a youth and kid-friendly version so your entire family can be involved. These practices will be highlighted in sermons throughout our series and allow you to track your growth in these areas. We hope you take this series to commit to these habits and join us in deepening our faith. As we become better, our scripture for today is Psalm 95, 1 through 7. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our faith development is a journey. It's made up of big and small moments that string together a relationship between Jesus and us, between the communities that we connect with, like camp experiences, retreats, individual devotion, and sometimes those holy moments that we have when we're out in nature. And today we're focusing in on worship. And so worship, both corporately and individually, provides intentional practices nurturing our relationship with God and with each other. Now we hear in Psalm 95 this invitation. Now, I don't know about you, but I love to receive invitations. First, I like to see how they're crafted, the beautiful way that they're put together, the wording. And then I get excited about celebrating with somebody I care about. You know, whether it's a save the date for a wedding, which really is the precursor to the invitation, or a birthday, or especially like a surprise birthday party, because you get excited and that person is going to be so excited when they are at the event and all of their friends are gathered to honor them. And in particularly at this time in our year, there's lots of invitations to graduations and to weddings. And now in my family, we're about to have one of our big family weddings. And I'm so excited about all the invitations that are coming to showers, to brunches, and then we finally got the invitation to the actual wedding. And my family put, put it up on our refrigerator so that each day we could celebrate and anticipate this great event in the lives of our family. So I know that sometimes when you receive an invitation, you'll feel obligated to go. No, you guys never do feel obligated? I was like, oh, maybe it's just me. Yes, some of them. But for a majority of the invitations that we receive, we joyfully anticipate celebrating with somebody because we have a relationship with them. And they have a relationship with us. And we want to honor and celebrate and weave our lives together deeper and richer by sharing these experiences. Now, we hear that in our scripture for today, this invitation from God to come and worship. Listen to the beautiful way that God has invited us to worship. 
O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before our maker. Over and over again, God is asking us to be in God's presence for the purpose of worshiping God. Now, this is something I want you to note, a big note, a big yellow sticky note. This is not a command. This is not a, you must come and worship me. This is not, you are obligated to come to worship, especially Sunday morning worship. <laughs> right, word? Some of us might have been part of traditions that required us to go to church, that required us to be at worship. We had to go for our salvation, or we were required to get our get into heaven card. Or to be labeled a good Christian, we had to attend. But note here, this is a simple invitation. A simple invitation to come and be part of the party of God. Yes, I did say the party of God. Worship should be a party. No? Absolutely, it should be joy-filled, and because it is about attending to a relationship and not abiding by a religion. So, we hear in this invitation who this host is that is inviting us to the party. We first hear that is the rock of my salvation. So, in referring to God as the rock... We must, yes, I'm ready. <laughs> we must recognize that God had the title of the rock before Dwayne Johnson. When we talk about God being the rock of our salvation, we're talking about a God who is a place of safety for us. A God who provides safety throughout history for God's people. God has always moved in our lives to bring us to safety and freedom. We read about the large moments in the Bible where God is moving. God moves from death to life. God in creation brought order out of chaos. God led the Israelites from slavery to freedom. God was present in the fire with Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Names you haven't heard since vacation Bible school. God was with Ruth and Naomi, finding a way from death of a son and a husband into a new life. And God has been with many of us in those death places in our lives, guiding supporting, breathing new life into what we thought was gone. God provides a way from what is death to life. Then we hear that this person inviting us to worship party is a king above all gods. The king above all gods might be a strange title to us. We might sing it, but really, is it something that we understand or really connect with? Because if you remember some point in our history, we kicked the king out. Yes, you do remember that. I was a little scared. And then beyond some of us being royal watchers, we don't have a lot of experience with a monarchy. Yet when it comes to God being the ruler of all creation, we experience God not as some king sitting on a throne decreeing things, but as the creator, author of all life. The psalmist today, in poetic language, recounts to us, in his hands are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are God's alone. God is our maker, designer of our life. 
Now, I know in our modern age, we have scientific understanding of the intricacies of creation and how creation evolves. But coupled with this poetic language, it points to a God who calls forth our beautiful creation. It was God who spoke the spark into nothingness and started this beautiful process. We also live in an age where the panoply of gods is really antiquated or relegated to myth or fairy tale. The depiction of other gods might not really pertain to us when we read the scripture because we count ourselves as monotheists, believing in one God. Yet, when we're honest with ourselves, there might be things in our lives that we treat as gods. Some of my closest friends would say that I treat shoes that way. They give me power. Hayward Spangler explains it this way. Is monotheism a given or something we must consciously assert, as did the Israelites? Consider that our lives are replete with institutions, objects, schools, government programs, technology, shoes insert your own, that we can trust as falsely as some ancient people trusted Baal or Zeus. Sometimes we have items in our lives that we trust or rely on more than God. So then we move to this other picture of God in our scripture for today. People of God's pasture. We're like, this is one we're familiar with. While the title King of All Gods draws our eyes and spirits out to the vast, elaborate creation, being people of God's pasture is more familiar. We know the good shepherd, the one who takes care of the sheep, who calls to us, and we recognize that we belong in God's pasture, that God is awesome as creator of the universe, and as intimate as a shepherd who knows his sheep. So now that we know who the host of this worship party is, we respond to the call, the God who is bringing us safety, moving us from death to life, the one who is the author of everything. And so we move to worship. And our psalm provides a basic order of worship. Now, I know we get elaborate in worship because it is a worship party. But here is a simple way to think about worship. We sing. Now, I love worshiping with you all, with Valencia, because I know when I come to worship, there is exuberant and exquisite music. I'm not a musician, and I can barely sing. Christine can attest to that. But it doesn't matter um, if we're a great musician or can beautifully sing, for when we unite our voices together in singing, it lifts all of us heavenward. When I lived in London, we attended the Deptford Methodist Church and Mission. And I clearly remember this one church service where the gentleman behind me was singing. And he was singing terribly. It sounded awful, even to my untrained ears. But then... My heart was filled with joy because this gentleman behind me was so filled with love and praise for Jesus. He was singing and making a joyful noise. Singing unites us and fills the room and the world with the joyful noise of God's power to change us and the world. We also move to thanking. 
Another way we respond to God's actions in our lives is by thanking God and being able to recognize those blessings. Greg Anderson, in Living Life on Purpose, tells a story about a man whose wife had left him. He had, he had um, lost faith in himself and other people. And so on a rainy morning, he stumbled into a small neighborhood restaurant for breakfast. Although several people were at the diner, no one was speaking to anyone. Yet in one of the small booths, right by the window, there was a mom and her daughter, and they had just gotten their food, and the daughter spoke loudly, as sometimes children do. Mom, why don't we say our prayers here? The waitress kind of looked at the family, looked at those in the restaurant, and she said, sure, we can pray here. Will you say a prayer for us? So the little girl said, God is great, God is good, and we thank him for our food. Amen. And that changed the mood within the diner. It changed the, our friend who was at the counter who had lost faith. He said, all of a sudden, my whole frame of mind started to improve. From that little girl's example, I started to thank God for all that I did have and stop majoring, stop majoring in what I didn't have. Being grateful has the power to change us and our relationships. We also move to kneeling. Now, I know kneeling is not normally part of our tradition. There are some United Methodist churches that have kneeling rails, and they use that during communion or special services. But kneeling, again, is like, feels like an antiquated posture. It feels hmm, part of religion. But I think when we really dive into what kneeling is about, it's about bending our lives toward God. It's about allowing God's will for us to come in because we move toward or bow, kneel toward God. And this allows God to be that truth speaker. Now, do you all have that truth speaker in your life? No, you need to get one. It's the person who, no matter what, can speak truth to you. Not a friend who just agrees with everything that's going on, but the friend who can tell you you have food in your teeth or that your life's a mess. When we bend our lives toward God... We are allowing God to be the truth speaker in our lives. Now, now that we know the ability of what worship can do for us, I know that we have an opportunity to bend our lives toward God when we're here in this big moment of being with God. Now, our psalm today ends with the words, today if you hear God's voice. So I hope you've heard, we will hear God's voice here in worship. But I hope that there will be small moments when we leave that we find personal time to worship. And that can be in finding a prayer partner, someone who you pray with regularly, someone who you text, hey, I need prayers for this in my life today. It could be that you dive deeper into Bible studies so that you can hear how God has been in other person's lives and how God might be in your life. And then there's personal devotion, a time in which you set aside.
to worship God. How many of you find that one difficult? Right? Right? It's like I sit down, I'm going to worship God by being reflective, and then my mind goes to my laundry list. Maybe finding time to personally worship. Maybe outside in that vast creation. Being at the party with God in the big moments of corporate worship or the small moments of private devotion have the power of drawing us into connection with God. And that powerful connection has the ability to make us better. The ability to get into our lives and mix things up and draw us into who God is so longing for us to be. Hayward Spangler writes this about our psalm. To be sure, Psalm 95 does not indicate how God's power can be known in every situation. For instance, by commending particular rules or commandments. However, just as it encourages discernment about the differences between God's will and our own for the environment, it encourages a more general awareness that what we would plan for ourselves and what God may call us to do can be very different. Let us pray. Great and gracious God, we give thanks for your word, for your willingness to call us into moments of worship so that you can mess things up and recreate us exactly how you picture Amen.